The Art of War. It's a 2,500-year-old text written by Sun Tzu. Sun Tzu was a great general in ancient China. He was known for his ruthlessness, but also for his immense abilities to succeed at warfare. And he lived at a time when there was a great deal of warfare. That was a valuable skill. China was then not a unified country. It was divided into a lot of warring states. In fact, later there's a period of Chinese history known as the Warring States Period. But that had been true for hundreds of years. And Sun Tzu developed a way of succeeding that continues to be influential. When I was chair of the philosophy department for 10 years, it was the book that I found most valuable for understanding how to engage in institutional type of conflicts. And of course, it's useful in more literally warfare contexts as well. A commanding officer in the Marine Corps gave every Marine who was going to be involved in Operation Desert Storm a copy of The Art of War. So let's talk about the fundamentals of The Art of War. Let's turn then to Sun Tzu's advice. He begins The Art of War by saying this, The Art of War is governed by five constant factors to be taken into account in one's deliberations when seeking to determine the conditions obtaining in the field. These are first, well, this translation has the moral law. In the Chinese, it's the Tao. Now, we have to understand the philosophical background of this text. Sun Tzu is writing, not in the Confucian tradition, where the Tao means the path, the way, the right way to live. And so moral law is not a bad translation, if you think of this in Confucian terms. But really, I think it's a Taoist text. And the Tao in Taoism is not just the path, the right way to live. It has a deeper kind of meaning. In part, the Taoist is a metaphysical monist, thinking that all the divisions, all the distinctions of this world are really, in some sense, illusory, that fundamentally there is one thing in the universe, the Tao. That makes it a bit like the Hindu concept of Brahman, for example, or the basic concept of being or substance or the underlying unity, often called the absolute in versions of absolute idealism, that is the one thing out of which the universe is constructed. But it's much more than just that metaphysical unity underlying the world. In Taoism, it has two important additional features. First of all, it is dynamic. The Tao is what determines what things are, but also what things do. And so it is something like the Force, if you want to think of it that way, in Star Wars terms. It's the Force. It's the thing that makes things do what they do, that drives the universe. It is a dynamic thing. And secondly, it is normative. It not only determines what things are and what they do, but also what they ought to be and what they ought to do. Those are important features of the Tao. So if you want to think about the Force, it's not a bad way of reconstruing what the Tao is like in Taoism. So what is he saying here? He's saying the first thing you have to understand in understanding warfare is the Tao, the ways of the Force. Now, that's going to make it sound a bit too Star Wars, maybe. And so let's understand what that really means. It means you have to understand how things work. You have to understand the ways of the world. You have to get it. You have to realize what the situation is. You have to understand the general features that are involved in whatever dimension of conflict we're dealing with. It might be military. It might be institutional. Maybe you see yourself as an agent of change, fighting against the forces of the status quo. Maybe it's something personal. Maybe it's something political. There may be many dimensions along which you may be involved in this situation of pure competition. But you have to understand the way things work. You have to understand that dimension. And you have to grasp the norms governing it. You have to understand not only the way things work and how they are, but the how they ought to be. You're only going to be able to win if you understand what to do. And that's going to mean understanding the circumstances, understanding how things work, how they're put together, but also understanding what it is you ought to be accomplishing. The second thing you have to understand is heaven. Night and day, cold and heat, times and seasons. 
He's referring here to the changeable, to the variable features of the situation. You not only have to understand how things work in general, you have to understand the particular circumstances you're facing here. It won't do to just understand the laws of physics, for example, in an abstract sense. If you want to understand how to drive a car, you have to understand the actual circumstances. Is it sunny? Is it raining? Is it daytime? Is it nighttime? Is there going to be a lot of traffic? Do I have to worry about rush hour, etc., etc. And so all of those things involve variables. You have to understand the variable features of the situation to know what to do. But then third, Earth. You have to understand the constant features. He gives as examples here, distances great and small, danger and security, open ground and narrow passes, the chances of life and death. You have to understand, in other words, the constant features of the situation. Let's go back to that driving analogy. You have to not only understand whether it's sunny or raining, night or day, you have to understand, well, what kind of road is this? Limited access highway? Is it a bumpy mountain road? What am I going to be driving on? Understand the constant features of the situation you're going to be facing, as well as the variable features. Fourth, the commander. In effect, he's saying here, leadership matters. It's going to make a big difference how effective the leader is. The virtues of a leader, he says, are wisdom, sincerity, benevolence, courage, and strictness. Now, some of those are the basic virtues of Confucianism. Sincerity, for example. Benevolence. Ren is something that Confucius often uses as well for virtue as a whole, in addition to a more specific kind of virtue involving benevolence toward other people. Wisdom. We could think of that as the kind of knowledge that's involved in determining where the mean is and how to distinguish virtues from the corresponding vices. But what about courage and strictness? Those are not things that are found in Confucian texts, but courage and strictness here are very important. So we have to be wise in knowing what to do. We have to be benevolent and be concerned for the welfare of our own troops as well as for other people. We have to be sincere. You can't fool around on the battlefield and hope to win. We have to be courageous. We have to be brave. We have to face risks and take action despite risks. And finally, discipline is required. Self-discipline on the part of the commander, but also discipline among the troops. Leadership requires discipline, self-discipline, as well as keeping other people in line with the vision. So the leader has to exhibit a certain internal quality, a kind of unity of self-discipline, but also has to instill that discipline in others to keep them directed toward the same goal. A leader has to lead in part by having discipline among the followers, getting them to have the self-discipline to do what needs to be done. The final factor then correspondingly is method and discipline. Now here the idea is how well is the institution, how well is the organization, the army, let's say, or this division of the company, or whatever it is, how well is it structured? And within it, are people doing what they ought to do? How well is it functioning? So it won't do to be a leader who inspires people if there is no structure, if there is no organization, and in fact, you're just leading a mob, and if it doesn't function very well, if people aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. So people have to be organized in the right sort of way, and they have to actually be doing what they ought to do. They ought to be playing their roles in the organization. If people aren't organized well, or if they're organized, but on the other hand, aren't fulfilling their functions well, aren't playing the roles you've assigned to them, then the organization is not going to be effective. Now, what does it take to win? Sun Tzu says there are seven questions we ought to ask, and the answers to those questions determine the probability of victory or defeat. They're important questions, and some of them correspond precisely to what we've just talked about, an understanding of the Tao, of heaven and earth, of the constant and the variable factors. It's a question of the qualities of leadership and the nature of the organization. So let's go to the questions. First of all, which leader is imbued with the moral law. In other words, which leader best understands how things work and how they ought to work? Secondly, which leader has the most ability? In other words, who's just going to be able to lead more effectively? 
Third, with whom lie the advantages derived from heaven and earth? The constant factors, as well as the variable factors, do they give an advantage to one person or the other? They might. Somebody might have them high ground. The other might have to attack uphill. Or it might be that one has to move heavy equipment quickly through a rainstorm. Those constant and variable factors can give one party the advantage over the other. Fourth, on which side is discipline most effective? We have to understand which organization is working better. Who's doing what they're supposed to be doing? Who's got the proper organization? Where is it functioning most effectively? Fifth, which army is stronger? Strength isn't everything, but it helps to have more troops. It helps to have more equipment. If you're a company, it helps to have more to spend on advertising, to spend on research and development, to spend on making that product design as beautiful as possible. On which side are the officers and the men more highly trained? The more training people have, the more they're going to be able to do effectively what you want them to do. Finally, in which army is there a greater constancy of reward and punishment? Reward and punishment might be a harsh way of putting it, but it's connected to that question of discipline. And the general idea, I think, is this. People have to be given the right kinds of incentives to do what you want them to do, but also to avoid doing the kinds of things you don't want them to do. If you haven't set up the proper system of incentives so that people are rewarded for performing effectively, and so that they are penalized if they don't perform effectively, then things are going to fall apart. So within the army, you have to find out which side is going to reward and to punish most constantly and most effectively. But within any organization in general, you're going to think who is actually getting rewarded for doing a good job and how reliably are people being punished? Are people suffering for not doing a good job? An organization that fails to reward its high performers and that fails to give any disincentive to people performing poorly is going to end up with a lot of people performing poorly. That's going to make a difference to the effectiveness of the organization. I want to make one final point about Sun Tzu's general ideas in the art of war before we get on to some more specific points. And it's simply this. In fact, we could use Nassim Taleb's phrase for this, optionality. Unlike Taleb, Sun Tzu is not opposed to having a goal in mind, to having an end. Indeed, in the military, the end is victory. But the idea is this. Although we do want to have a goal, and we want to have a plan, he says, forget this idea of just putting aside planning because there are too many black swans. No, we need to think through the plan very carefully beforehand. Indeed, he says, the general who wins a battle makes many calculations in his temple before the battle is fought. So you've got to have a plan, and you've got to think it through carefully. You've got to anticipate various problems and try to solve them in advance. Ponder and deliberate before you make a move, he says. But it's very important not to stick to the plan too closely. It's been said that no plan survives first contact with the enemy. And so you've got to be willing to adapt to circumstances. That's why I said the key term, it seems to me, is really optionality. You've got to recognize opportunities and take advantage of them. So you need a decentralized structure that's going to allow people on the ground to respond quickly and take advantage of opportunities. You've got to allow your army to adapt the plan to take advantage of opportunities. So Sun Tzu says this, according as circumstances are favorable, one should modify one's plans. Take advantage of those opportunities. Make modifications. Realize this isn't working out, but there's a big opportunity over here. And adapt. You've got to be adaptable. You've got to be flexible. You've got to be willing to recognize that the circumstances are going to change. After all, the successful leader is one who understands the variable as well as the constant circumstances. And in conflict itself, things are always going to be changing. So that idea of variable circumstances means, in part, keeping up with what exactly is going on in the battlefield. It may be that suddenly the rain starts and you have to adapt. It may be that suddenly the enemy right flank begins to fall apart. 
or in an organization. It might be the person who's opposing your plan and fighting your goal all the way along suddenly decides to take a job at another company. That creates an opportunity. And so what you saw as a roadblock to be avoided before now can become a path of least resistance. You've got to be willing to adapt the plan as circumstances change. Well, all this said, we can forecast probabilities of victory or defeat. But don't get too cocky. Don't think that you can guarantee victory. The key, in a way, is not to make mistakes. If you don't make mistakes, you can protect yourself against defeat. But you can't guarantee victory, in part because you can't guarantee that your opponent is going to make mistakes. And you can't guarantee that circumstances won't shift heavily against you. So Sun Tzu says this, to secure ourselves against defeat lies in our own hands. But the opportunity of defeating the enemy is provided by the enemy himself. Thus the good fighter is able to secure himself against defeat, but can't make certain of defeating the enemy. Hence the saying, one may know how to conquer without being able to do it. A good leader is one who knows how to conquer, knows how to attain victory. But that doesn't mean the good leader always wins. Sometimes circumstances conspire against even a great leader. Sometimes it turns out that the other party, the adversary, simply doesn't make mistakes. So in short, you can protect yourself against defeat, but you can't guarantee a win.